Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer at the Holocaust Center for Humanities. A live transcript for this program is available on Zoom for anyone who would like to use it. Click Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen and click Show Subtitles. The Holocaust Center for Humanity is located in downtown Seattle, just a few blocks away from the famous Pike Place Market. The Holocaust Center sits on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. We honor with gratitude the land itself and those who came before us, stewarded the land and remain leaders and activists within our community. You can learn more about the history of the land on which you live and the indigenous people who lived there before you at the website that is currently just put in the chat. Today marks the start of early giving for Give Big, the annual community day of giving. Give Big will officially take place on May 3rd and 4th, but early giving starts today. This year, we are raising funds to record, preserve, and share oral histories from local Holocaust survivors. This is more important now than ever. We have seen over and over again that these stories of survivors change hearts and minds. Please consider making an early gift. Gifts right now will be matched dollar for dollar thanks to several generous donors who are matching your donations. Whether it's $25 or $2,500, all gifts make a difference. And there's a link in the chat where you can go to make a gift or learn more about Give Big. I want to thank our 2022 Lunch and Learn series sponsors, the City of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture and the Francis Roth and Stanley R. Schill Foundation. But I also want to thank all of you for tuning into these programs so regularly over the last two years. Today's program is number 85. Hundreds of you tune into these programs each week or every other week, and we keep on going because of you. We read your comments and feedback, and we have lots more content and speakers to offer in the coming months. So thank you so much for being on this journey with us. Our news feeds and homes continue to be filled with harrowing images and accounts from Ukraine. In response to the reports of mass graves and acts of brutality against Ukrainian citizens by Russian armed forces, 17 Holocaust museums from four countries have raised their voices together to speak out. This includes our Holocaust Center. These 17 institutions, which are dedicated to working towards a future where never again is a reality for everyone, have come together to create a statement. And you can read the full statement on our website, but here is a highlight. Museums are bearers of history. By housing the artifacts and documents of the past, we ensure that the truth, both noble and horrific, of what humanity has done remains shared and accessible. We at Holocaust museums around the world have a particular mission. The stories we tell are ones of destruction and pain and of the nobility of upstanders who risked their lives to do what was right and to help others. We not only aim to educate, to honor our survivors' wishes and their stories are not forgotten, but to make a better future where the stories we tell are no longer repeated. We call upon our governments around the world to do more to stop these atrocities and assist those who have been brutalized. We support the International Criminal Court's investigation of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. April is Genocide Awareness Month. It's a time to raise awareness that we must protect innocent people, prosecute perpetrators, prevent future atrocities, and remember those who have suffered all around the world. Today's program is the fourth in our series, Understanding and Disrupting Genocide. I'm honored to have with us today, Rushan Abbas, who has become an international voice on behalf of the persecuted Uyghur population. Since 2014, the Chinese government has incarcerated over 1 million Uyghur citizens in internment camps without any legal process. This is the largest scale detention of ethnic and religious minorities since World War II. 
Experts estimate that since 2017, some 16,000 mosques have been razed or damaged and hundreds of thousands of children have been forcibly separated from their parents and sent to boarding schools. In 2017, Rushan Abbas established the campaign for Uyghurs to advocate for her people among government officials and lawmakers, interfaith organizations, universities, and think tanks, and as well, grassroots movements. In September 2018, her own sister was abducted by the Chinese regime and illegally sentenced to prison in retaliation for Rushan's activism. Today, Rushan continues to advocate for her release and the freedom of millions of other Uyghurs. She frequently testifies, briefs, and advises on policy and legislative response. She works frequently with the State Department to engage with international civic society and meets with international government leaders. Rushan received the Freedom Fighter 2019 Award for her work raising awareness on the current Uyghur genocide. Rushan is joining us today from California where she is working and visiting with her children. She will take questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to type in questions at any time. Thank you so much, Rushan, for being with us today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ilana. Um, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity if uh, Richard can go ahead and start. The uh, presentation. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, speak to you today and the uh, thank you Holocaust Center for Humanity for the honor of uh, you know giving me the honor of speaking to you. I would like to begin uh, today with a quote from Ili Weisel, a Holocaust survivor as you all know the, and the author. Dr. Wiesel wrote in his famous book, Night, quote, I told him that I did not believe that they could burn people in our age, that humanity would not tolerate it, unquote. Here we are in the modern age, finding that the most base and the brutal side of human nature is being encouraged to manifest itself in new technologically enabled ways, in the past few years, we have heard a lot about Chinese tariffs and the, uh, the CCP's brutalities in Hong Kong and the, what's happening today in Shanghai with coronavirus, but very little about the modern slavery and the concentration camps. So we have one to eight million to three million people. Imagine three million people in the concentration camps which is almost a half of the entire population of the Washington state. And it's the number of innocent Uyghur people who have been forced into Chinese concentration camps and that none of them charged with any crimes. Next. So just to give a little bit of history, the East Turkestan, our homeland is referred as Xinjiang today by the Chinese regime was a prominent center of commerce for more than 2000 years located in Central Asia and the cradle of scholarship, culture and the power. But the Manchus invaded our homeland in 1876 and renamed the, the Xinjiang, which means new territory in Chinese. It's a, a colonialized title and we do not like to use that. Um, our people, established the uh, East Turkestan Republic twice, one in 1933, one in 1944, and the current regime, the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party occupied our homeland in 1949. Next. As you see this uh, beautiful uh, picture on the two sides of the map um, uh, in the, in the uh, Northwest corner of uh, China right now, uh, the landscaping is a sandwich between high mountains, desert, high mountains, desert, and high mountains. And the, um, of course, you know, when we say desert, we all know what's under the desert, the oil, uh, gas, and the uh, um, location, I mean, um, 
the territory wise, it's about one sixth of entire China, which is about four times of California. And the population, the Chinese consensus itself, population data in the Chinese government's official numbers shows it's about 11 to 12 million. And back in uh, 2015 that they published that. Next. And um, I want to play this short video. This guy, Victor Zhikaigao, is a Chinese lawyer, and he's an academic and the uh, media spokesperson for the Chinese Communist Party. And he is the uh, vice president of Beijing-based uh, think tank Center for China and the Globalization. So he purposely mentions an Al Jazeera when he was being interviewed, the Uyghur population is six to seven million. If you can play that video, please. No, I think uh, uh, the reports uh, uh, do not exist in line with the realities. In Xinjiang altogether, there are about six or seven million Uyghur people. You are talking about, let's say, one million for the six or seven million Uyghur people in Xinjiang. That's ludicrous. These are not facts. These are misleading things. Try to diffuse, try to confuse the world. I think uh, no, in these reports do not exist in line with the realities. In so anyway, um, so when he purposely used that uh, six or seven million, what happens to five million population, four to five million that the Chinese government's own uh, population data shows? So that should be a concern. As I mentioned, China's one third of natural gas and oil reserves and 40% of coal reserves comes from our homeland and also produces 84% of China's cotton output to the world and the huge um, tomato production. And this is the current situation. Many of us would like to believe that the world has uh, learned from the darkest parts of the history, but at present, the international community is failing its own conscience it's the failing the vote never again when you see racism and cutting ash technology are used to exert control over an entire nation. The Uyghurs, the entire race, entire Uyghur population, alongside with Kazakhs and the other Kazakh, Uzbek, Kyrgyz, other Turkic Muslim uh, population of East Turkestan are facing this Orwellian security, forced sterilization, abortions, child abduction, concentration camps, modern slavery, organ harvesting, and the crematorials are being built next to the concentration camps for a culture that doesn't practice cremation. A document quoted party secretary Chin Chuen Guo on the detention centers states that those camps should teach like a school and be managed like a military and defended like a prison. And the, the same document also says must for first break their lineage, break their roots, and break their connections, and break their origins. Next. So some pictures of the concentration camps, basically. Um, you see those uh, pictures of uh, uh, inside of the camps, those crowded rooms, are where these people are sleeping at night. And those are not just the numbers when we say one to three million innocent people. They, those are fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. And those are university presidents and the professors, famous writers, um, educated, uh, you know, famous uh, singers, successful business people, all the thought leaders basically being targeted. Next. China called those camps vocational training centers after denied the existence of it. Um, but uh, when you look at those you know, armed guards and the, uh, what we saw earlier, it shows the, the reality, brutal reality. This, what you are seeing on the screen right now is drone video showing hundreds of blindfolded shaved head Uyghur men being led from a train in China. And most of them are dressed in the purple and the orange vests in the word it says 
Kashgar Detention Center printed on them. And this looks like, you know, taking the shaved head blindfolded men to the train, looks like some horror movies from World War II. But no, this is the reality. This is today's Uyghurs, what they are facing today. Next. And those are the brave victims and the uh, you know, former inmates. They were only be able to release from those camps because they hold other countries' passports or they um, belong, they married to other country citizens. And according to them, people inside of the camps, they are subject to forsake their religion, ethnic identity, and they are subject to mental and physical torture and the systematic mass rape. And they are subject to taking unknown medications, food, sleep deprivation, dehydration, and as we saw earlier, overcrowded rooms. Next. Basically, the Chinese regime is waging a war on religion, on free thought, culture, and the Uyghur ethnicity while conducting this full speed genocide. Chinese officials have even uh, stated that the, the religion is a disease, mental disease that needs to be cured. A Chinese official who was interviewed in a documentary even plainly said that Uyghurs do not have human rights. So violating is not a subject, is not the uh, issue. So basically what's happening to the Uyghurs is a reflective of dangerous ideology that will not stop with only Uyghurs and but uh, will rather spread and brutalize more and more people. Next. Chinese government basically outlawed every single aspect of religion while they are waging a war on Islam. When they say the Uyghurs are engaged in illegal Islamic practice, they are talking about any kind of normal practice like praying, uh, during, uh, you know, uh, fasting during Ramadan or praying or, you know, not talking about wearing hijab, but just wearing a long shirts for Uyghur women considered as illegal religious uh, clothing, and they are being publicly humiliated on the streets, subject to, you know, their shirts are being cut here. Next. Um, back in the late 2016, we heard that all Uyghurs were mandatory DNA collection and the uh, health check, medical, uh, uh, medical check. We were not sure what was that for. And then later we started to see halal organs being advertised in some of the uh, Chinese hospitals in Arabic speaking countries. And that this is a uh, uh, specially, like it's a special line in the, uh, in the Kashgar airport, a uh, special line was dedicated for people, passengers transporting human organs. Next. So this is a before and after picture of Kusan Pathway in Kuchar. Um, right side is the same place what you see on the left several years ago. On the left side, this is the normal like somewhat normal lives back in uh, 2012, 2013. People used to come there early morning after sunrise and then uh, do their trading and they you know, sell their goods and the foods and the fruits and then go home after sunset. Basically during the uh, daytime, that was the normal lives of the Uyghur people. And look at the one right, right side now, what happened to the people? The people are just disappearing. Next. And also as part of this genocide, Uyghur women are subject to forced marriage. And the, uh, the government is sponsoring those forced marriages by offering those uh, Chinese men money, housing, and the jobs. And if the Uyghur women refuse such a forced marriage, she's being labeled as Islamic extremist, radicalized Muslim, did not want to marry non-Muslim Chinese. Look at those girls' faces. Do they look like they're attending their wedding? Next. And also Chinese state media reported that 1.1 million Han Chinese men moved into Uyghur homes 
to live inside of their houses, monitor and supervise their daily lives. Most of the men are taken to the concentration camps or prisons or sent to forced labor facilities. What do you think is happening to those women in their own home, in their own bed? The Uyghur women are facing sexual abuse inside of their own homes. I call this government-sponsored mass rape of the Uyghur women. Next, let's play that short video, please. The man is taking this video and there's three hands Chinese men on the bed and there's this woman with the infant in her arm. What do you think happened to her after the camera was put down that night in her bed? Next. Look at those kids. Those are Uyghur kids dressed up like Han Chinese, which Chinese people doesn't even use today to dress their own kids. And the one on the right is a, a state-run orphanage, looks like a prison cell with double barbed wires and the uh, armed policemen in front of it. A country committing active genocide should not be given the free reign to control others through the investment or economic coercion. A regime tearing over 900,000 Uyghur children away from parents and sending them to state-run orphanages to be brainwashed should not be allowed to exercise control over our Western academic institutions and our, um, you know, everything you name it, the, uh, from NBA to Hollywood to uh, uh, corporate America, a country that brought concentration camps and the slavery as um, normalized institutions back into modern age should not be hosting the Olympic games, which they just did. These are all happening on your watch and how much more will we allow them to get away with the next. And BBC recently reported that the, the females, the women in the concentration camps are subject to systematic rape and sexual torture not just the forced sterilization and forced abortions. Basically, Uyghur women's bodies are being the battleground on this genocide. And uh, Xi Jinping's wife, Peng Liyuan, is sitting at the United Nations Special Envoy for Women and the Girls' Rights. It's like a slap on the face of anybody who's supposed to defend feminism or human rights. And also, after they sterilized the Uyghur women, after the Uyghur population dropped, the Chinese, um, if you can move to the next one, the Chinese embassy in the United States, actually the Chinese embassy in the US tweeted that Uyghur women are no longer baby making machines, referencing the gender equality and the productive health after they forcibly sterilizing them. Next, as Alina mentioned earlier, my own sister became a um, target. So as I mentioned earlier, intellectuals and artists and the uh, doctors among the imprisoned, and my own sister is a retired medical doctor who speaks fluent Mandarin Chinese and he, she has no need for any kind of vocational training, but the Chinese regime took her six days after I spoke publicly condemning the Chinese regime's brutal action in uh, September, 2018. And they, um, after months and months of no news, finally Radio Free Asia confirmed that, that she was detained. But still yet today, after 42 months, three and a half years, I have no idea of her whereabouts and her condition of her health or even if she's still alive. I have not seen any proof of life. Next. In response to building international outcry, the regime uh, declared that uh, back in um, 
right before pandemic, actually March of 2020, they said that all Uyghurs have graduated, but none of the missing family members came home. So where is my sister? Where is Bahram Sintash's father? Where is the Akida Dawood's mother, Raila Dawood? Where are the millions of people still missing? Where are our loved ones? So we started a campaign, still no info hashtag campaign, looking for our family members. Next. So every place I go, protesting in front of the Chinese embassy or holding my sister's picture in every place I go and I speak and all the social media postings, I have been holding my sister's picture. But then, next. The Chinese government small space Global Times reported that the allegedly missing Uyghurs found living normally was the headline of the article. And if you look at that second paragraph, they said they named me Rushana Bas, said I, you know, I was stealing other people's photo and information, claiming those are my missing relatives and spreading rumors about China. Basically, they said my sister did not exist. And the uh, Li Zhenzhou, who is the Chinese official, deputy director of Chinese foreign ministry, tweeted with my picture, demonizing me, trying to discredit my work. Next. And then we heard from third party on a Christmas day, 2020, that my sister was sentenced 20 years on the terrorism related charges. So when we did the, um, press conference with the Congressional Executive Committee on China. When Reuters reporter asked the spokesperson Bang Wen Bin the picture on the right about my sister, he forgot that how they were saying my sister did not exist and I was lying about China, about my missing relatives. He acknowledged my sister by calling her name and said that they did sentence her. Next. So come back to the Uyghurs graduated. So where did they graduate to? In, a, in the spring of 2020, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute did a report, the title of the report is Uyghurs for Sale. Literally Uyghurs are being sold to companies and most of them are, if you move to the next please, more than 100 globally renowned companies have Uyghur slave labor in their supply chains in China. The many times the Chinese regime lied about every nature of the camps revealed the truth. First, you know, they denied the existence of the camps. Then they called them schools. Then they said those are vocational training centers. But now they are using Uyghurs, just Uyghur young Uyghur students, Uyghur kids, and the innocent Uyghur people to make money, making this genocide a profitable venture. So basically when there is an active genocide happening before the face of entire world community, when China's action in my homeland now includes every single act listed in the 1948 genocide convention, each of which the world, including China is obligated to prevent, it's not China's internal affairs anymore. The world must intervene, but those, the Western companies are making every one of us complicit with China's genocide. So there are, when there's crimes against humanity and a genocide is happening, there's perpetrators and enablers. China is the perpetrator, but all these Western companies using Uyghurs as slaves, continuing to do business with China, enabling China's economy to murder more people, are the enablers. Two years ago, certain tons of human here in the shipment seized by US customs, let the reality of the human lives this represent hit you. And this is also the pictures from the uh, SP report how the, uh, the region, Kashgar prefecture, and how they are moving the Uyghurs and the through like uh, companies like Qingdao 
Taekwang or XPCC, the Chinese being planned. Uh, they are acting like a temp agencies and they, they are producing goods for companies like Nike. That's why the Nike CEO announced last summer, June, 2021, Nike is a company of China and for China, of course, because they are making profit out of tears and the sweats and the very lives of the Uyghur slaves. Next, more companies, Puma, Adidas, and if you just keep moving, next. All these brands that you are familiar with, making every one of us complicit. I go to the department store. When I hold an item, if it says made in China, my heart starts to shake. Is my sister working in a somewhere in the dark dungeon making those goods? Am I buying my own sister's slave labor? Next. Look at those young kids. They are forcibly sent to take the trains and the buses to go to the manufacturing uh, facilities. Next. And look at them. They are wearing same uniform. They cannot communicate with their family members. They cannot go outside. They are being held against their will. Next. If you look at the uh, some of the um, the advertisement published by the, uh, the Chinese uh, temp agency, like companies claiming the supply, government sponsored Uyghur workers from our homeland to other provinces. What does that mean? Government sponsored Uyghur workers means that the Uyghur slaves taken against their wish and they're taken to the other provinces. Actually, there are some advertisements that they are saying, if you buy 2000 Uyghur workers, we will supply five um, armed policemen to guard them. Literally the modern slavery that they are practicing on our watch. Next. They claimed during the pandemic when they were sending those Uyghur students, Uyghur people, to China proper to work as a forced laborers. They claimed, the Chinese government claimed that the unemployment problem in Xinjiang must be resolved at all costs, despite the outbreak of pandemic. Basically they claim because of the uh, unemployment, they are taking those Uyghurs to China proper to get them jobs. But in reality, next. They are, advertising for Han Chinese people to come and live and work in East Turkestan and giving them all kinds of uh, lucrative incentives like free health care, free housing, free uh, utilities, and as well as uh, money. The Uyghurs are taken from their homes, vacating their homes and the lands for those Han Chinese settlers. Next. So there is a coalition and Uyghur forced labor in China now. Um, we had um, a bill introduced last year and they uh, passed bipartisan, uh, with bipartisan support and signed by President Biden became a law, um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. But those companies I mentioned earlier, like Nike, Coca-Cola, and the others actively lobbied against this bill because they did not want to uh, hurt their profit margin. 84% of cotton production from China comes from the Uyghur region, which means one out of every five cotton garments in the world that are tainted by Uyghur slaves forced labor. Next. Just take a look at those names. Those are the companies are complicit in China turning someone like my sister 
a retired medical doctor into a textile worker as a forced laborer in their supply chains. Next. So basically, when um, Russia invaded Ukraine, rightfully, all these companies left Russian market. That's very good. They're supposed to do that. But why are they not leaving from China when China is conducting genocide? Next. As I mentioned earlier, Hollywood, NBA, FIFA, and academia celebrities, and the talk show hosts who are usually so vocal against any sort of social injustice are voiceless today because the perpetrator has the money and the power because perpetrator is China. These companies, these people are willingly giving up freedom of expression, freedom of speech because of the profit that they are making from China's blood money. So basically now it's not just about the Uyghur's future or what's at stake is not just about the Uyghur people here. What's at stake is the freedom and the democracy that every, everyone in the West worked so hard in past 50 years, 70 years that established. The conscience of the humanity is at test. The conscience of the world is at test and we are failing it. Um, this is our company. Uh, I mean, our organization's uh, website, Campaign for Uyghurs. So try to go to our website and sign up for our mailing list. So you can uh, receive periodically updates of what's happening to Uyghur people. And also um, uh, the social media that you can follow us. And the, uh, just the, you know, keep yourself educated so you can educate the people around you. Um, we just saw, as I mentioned earlier, the atrocities is being committed by Russia against the Ukraine. And that is an ample example of what happens when we continue to appease the authoritarian regimes and refuse to take action. And China is no different. What China is doing to Uyghurs can be seen as a testing ground for what they wish to do to the world. So what we are witnessing today is not about the future of Uyghurs anymore. As I emphasize, you know, as I, I just cannot emphasize enough. And it's not something that's happening thousands of kilometers, thousands of miles away and then nothing to do with us. China is a threat to the world, threat to the humanity. And the, today what the Chinese government is doing is crimes against humanity, and it's a war against the freedom and the democracy. It's a war against the women, against children, against the free world. So many countries and international entities already give up their freedom of speech and allow the regime to silence them. Governments and the corporations have turned a blind eye to China's atrocities for the uh, prospect of short-term gains and they are not just giving up their freedom of speech, but eventually giving up their sovereignty in the long run. China is basically attempting to um, export their world view and the system globally. And they have shown what, uh, how, you know, what uh, uh, they can uh, attract to their own people and the people of East Turkestan, Tibet and the Hong Kong. It is a preview of what we will see uh, should we allow China to continue their crimes against humanity, or if we um, have the courage to stop uh, this uh, evident evil. Basically, if we do not face China's uh, Chinese regime today, it will be our children, our grandchildren, that will deal with the consequence of an illiberal world. Thank you. Thank you.
so much, Rushan, for your tireless work and your commitment to raising awareness to this just horrific injustice that is in, that is occurring. Um, you mentioned earlier that your sister was taken um, in part as retaliation for you speaking out. And I'm wondering um, if you have had or experienced other threats from the Chinese government or from individuals in the last three and a half years of you ramping up your efforts to speak out even more? Thank you. For, uh, that's a really uh, great question. Um, when I go around and they give uh, speeches for like this one and the um, now more and more in-person events, no matter if I'm at the uh, university like um, UC Berkeley or Tufts University or Denver University or all the way on the other side of the world like in Vienna or in Paris, I do get attacks by the Chinese students or the Chinese audiences. Also, they are living in a free world. Um, they try to uh, stop me speaking and they also uh, calling me a liar, basically repeating what the Chinese government is saying about me. So they are not just the controlling our freedom of speech by hostage taking our family members. They are not just the trying to hold my sister as a hostage and silence me there, but they are sending people like those so-called Chinese students and they try to um, discredit me. Um, I was on my way to participate on the panel to Columbia University. That was my biggest disappointment, actually. Uh, being in New York, Columbia University, I never thought that when I got there, the university is going to cancel our panel. It's supposed to be uh, myself and a Hong Kong activist and a Tibetan and the another Chinese dissident, four of us supposed to participate on one hour panel. And I took the bus early morning from Washington to New York. And when I got there, the panel was canceled because of the Chinese students at the university protested. I felt like I was in Beijing, not in New York. So how, Rushen, how do you, how do you keep going amidst all of this threat against you and in so many ways, and we'll get to some of these questions that are coming in about this topic too, but the, the inaction that you see by governments and individuals around the world, how, how, do you, how do you keep moving forward with this for all these years? Because we have the truth. We are speaking the truth. And that's why the Chinese government is so afraid of the truth. And more they attack us, which means that is a, uh, the impact of our strong messaging and the impact of our work. When the Chinese government took my sister as a hostage, when the Chinese government was uh, uh, punishing my sister for my advocacy work, as you know, I'm speaking to you today at the cost of my own sister's freedom, they, underestimated something which they never ever understand. The power of love, the love I have for my sister, the love I have for my people, for my homeland, the love I have for the freedom and the democracy is what's keeping me going. And I will keep going strong and I will never give up. That's why it frustrates me when I see all these powerful people, they are acting like they are so scared of this government. Well, what they scared of is not so much of their um, like family members being in danger or themselves being in danger. They are scared of the profit, the money that they don't want to lose with the Chinese market, with the Chinese government. That's so disappointing. When you look at your short-term economic benefits and you don't picture 
the future and what kind of threat the Chinese government can be to the humanity. That worries me because I didn't leave my homeland at the age of 21 and the missing my family members, my um, late parents when they were alive. I couldn't take care of them. I couldn't spend time with my friends and the families because I was looking for freedom. I was enjoying the freedom in this country, which I call home. The United States is my, my country, my home. And what I worry is I don't want the United States will become like China. If we don't stop China right now, that is going to happen. And that's what, keep, you know, you know, what keeps me going to educate people and they let them understand to speak up, not just the, to save the Uyghur people, but to save the freedom in this country, as I kept repeating myself like a broken record. I cannot emphasize enough. People are not seeing the danger the Chinese communist regime is posing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rushan, there's a, there's a question here that comes from Tom and he asks, what has been the reaction of Muslim countries to China's genocide and have they done any better than the American companies? Unfortunately, the Chinese government is, um, um, when they are, as you mentioned earlier, when they are demolishing um, 16,000 mosques, when they are calling Islam a mental disease, when they are not allowing the Uyghur people to practice normal um, Islamic uh, you know, practices, but they are building the largest mosque in Nigeria and that they are uh, putting together Islam in China conference in Malaysia. Hmm. So, and they, they are acting like uh, they, they support Islam and also, um, uh, calling, you know, those Uyghurs are terrorists and they, they giving this uh, lies to those countries. Very unfortunately, those countries, the leaders from the Islamic world are not realizing what Chinese government is up to. I would say before China start to colonize the Western world, they will take over those Muslim majority countries because it's already happening with the power of the Belt and Road Initiative and that threat diplomacy, and also the trade threats, and the manipulation in the United Nations as the second largest donor, China is becoming the power able to strong arm the world. So those leaders in Islamic countries should realize as a Muslim, it's their responsibility to defend their faith, but they are failing it. Hmm. Turkey is the yeah. only country actually, the Turkish foreign minister, Chao Sholo is repeatedly um, releasing statements and is speaking out against China's atrocities. But other than Turkey, not many Muslim majority countries are being vocal. Hmm. Um, Roshan, Eugene asks, uh, and this is kind of following up on what you were just talking about. He says, what specific actions are being taken by human rights organizations, for example, Amnesty International, and what is not being done and what do you believe should be done? There, there is a, a coalition being established with um, more than 200 human rights organizations led by Human Rights Watch and the other organizations to end the Uyghur forced labor and as well as raising awareness. But unfortunately, um, a lot of statements, a lot of um, words, but no real tangible action. Mm -hmm. um, joint statements being released from the United Nations, but we need more. We need the resolutions. We need the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, to release the human rights report that she has been sitting on for last a couple of years. She needs to release that report. She has been, uh, she has been appointed to her position for um, almost three and a half years now, since September, 2018, almost same time my sister was detained. She has not 
really released any kind of statement against the Chinese regime. This is really disappointing for us. It's against the founding principles of the United Nations. So she needs to release the report immediately. In why, March, why, does, why does she not release it? That's a great question. We don't know why. Mm -hmm. Her being a torture victim herself in the past, we thought when she came to this position, we thought that she is going to be someone, a strong defender of human rights and the, uh, do something, take some tangible action against the injustice against the Chinese regime. But almost makes one wonder, make, it makes you wonder if she's being selected there and put in her position to just to keep any kind of criticism or the human rights report being released against China. It's really disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at her records, she criticized the United States nine times in past three and a half years, but against a country conducting full speed active genocide, building concentration camps, and the, um, or, you know, operating the modern day slavery is not even getting one written report from her. And also when you look at the United Nations, China is sitting there on the Human Rights Council. It's like inviting the killer to judge his own trial. Hmm. Michelle, there's, um, there's a, a really interesting question here from Marcy and um, this might need to be our last question, but we'll see. She says, Thank you for your deep commitment. How are you able to obtain this critical information and these powerful images to show the truth to the world? Is this information being smuggled out of China and how do you keep yourself safe? Um, the people are basically jeopardizing their lives to send out those pictures on social media or on I don't use WeChat myself, but um, we have um, some people who uses WeChat, and the, uh, they have been, you know, sending us those um, uh, pictures. Actually, um, in January two thousand nineteen, there was a really disturbing a picture of two years old Rahmatul Sherbati was drowned inside of the irrigation ditch. Six months later, another three years old Parhat to the guy drowned in a river. In December, another uh, few months later, five years old Nasrullah Yusbaki was found frozen to death in a ditch. So we have the pictures, heartbreaking pictures of little Rahmatul and the Nasrullah's bodies, but it didn't make it to the mainstream media. And that's just the tip of the iceberg how many hundreds and the thousands of children's photos did not make it at all? How many remain missing? So basically we, we have to, to use every single piece of information we have and amplify that on our social media and be the voice for those voiceless people because of the information blockade and the China kicked out most of the uh, reporters from the area the information is not make it, making out to the world community. And that that's what the Chinese government is counting on, that there's not mm -hmm. enough people. And the Uyghurs are basically, every one of us, we have our loved ones, our, um, you know, our family members are being taken as a hostage. So basically the Chinese government have their hands on our neck, holding us from our neck. So when we speak out, we are jeopardizing the freedom of our, our family members. So when we see the other people who don't have to worry about such a, a threat by the Chinese regime and still not amplifying voices of those people, defenseless people. And you can imagine how frustrated I am for that. But. Yeah. You know, I believe the humanity is not dead. 
and yourself, Elena, and then uh, you know your organization and the other people who are here participating on this panel, asking those questions. I believe that every one of you will speak out, and it, not just for the Uyghur people, but the, the freedom of the, the future of this free world. And I know that you will be taking action, and that's what's keeping me going, the courage, hope, and those are the things actually leads me onward. Thank you, Rushan. And I think you are right. There is a responsibility that when we hear your story and when we see these images, we can't pretend that we don't know about it. We can't pretend that it isn't going on. It reminds me of the Holocaust survivor, Rudy Verba, who went to Vancouver, BC eventually, or other survivors who escaped horrific conditions and risked everything to tell the world about what was happening in Europe and only to find that people didn't believe them or that they didn't take action against it, that these stories were so terrible, they just imagined this couldn't really be happening. Mm -hmm. And um, you, your testimony reminds me of these stories that you know, we now look back on and wonder why didn't we do something when we heard these stories coming out? Why didn't we do something sooner? Thank you for risking so much to, to bring us this information. And I think I can speak for all of us when I tell you we're, we're behind you, we're working with you. There were a few wonderful comments that came in on our, on our Facebook page where people are watching through Facebook Live. And I just wanna read you a couple of them. Um, one of them says, you are amazing and I pray for you and your sister, God's peace and blessings to you. And Debbie writes, wishing you the best to locate your sister. And I'm so sorry, I had no idea. Thank you so much. So Rishan, you are, you are affecting all of us and we will carry this forward. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to join our conversation today. Thank you so much. And we are all responsible for what happens next. So let's save this world for our children. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone for joining today's program. This program was recorded and you'll find it on our website starting tomorrow. A reminder that today marks the start of early giving for Give Big. Give early and your donation will be matched 100%. All gifts support the collection, preservation, and sharing of oral histories from Holocaust survivors. And a link was in the chat, or you can find it on our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org. Every donation of any amount helps and it helps with programs like these. Thank you so much. We have several great events coming up and I hope you will join us. Um, there are three that I want to highlight. Coming up next week, Thursday, April 28th is Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day. Our museum will be open during the day with special activities and we will have an online program at 7 p.m. with a panel of local Holocaust survivors. Uh, a link is in the chat and you can find more information on our website about the program and the events that are going on that day. Again, that's next week, Thursday, April 28th for Yom HaShoah. Following that on May 3rd is our next Lunch and Learn program with Joshua Green entitled Hitler's Courts, the Misuse of Executive and Judicial Power. And lawyers can receive one CLE ethics credit for attending that program and mark your calendars on May 19th, in person and online, is author Dara Horn. She's the author of the book, People Love Dead Jews. Have you read the book yet? If you haven't, you should. Um, we will have a lively program and conversation and the in-person program will take place at Temple de Hirsch Sinai in Seattle. And you can also join online information and registration is now open on our website. So register, register today. Our Lunch and Learn programs are possible because we have a fantastic team at the Holocaust Center. Thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who's running that technical side of this show. Thank you to our CEO, Dee Simon, 
Lori Warshall Cohen, Paul Regelbrug, Julia Thompson, Morgan Romero, Amanda Davis, Devonshire Locke, Katie Lawrence, and Allie Latz. Thank you again to all of you for joining today's program. We look forward to seeing you at our next Lunch and Learn program on May 3rd and hopefully next week on the 28th for Yom HaShoah. This concludes our program for today.